Hello friends, I in this video shall be talking to you about the treatment of chylurea and as of now I will focus only on the conservative methods that can be used. If you see all the therapeutic strategies that we employ for management of these cases, the first strategy is to somehow decrease the production of chylomicrons. The next strategy is that whatever the chyle is flowing through the lymphatic pathway, it should not flow through the fistulae, the lymphatic or pelvic fistulae, but it will flow through the normal passages. That is second. And third is whatever is the site of leakage of chyle in the urinary system, either in the fornix or in the pelvis or in the ureter, that leakage can somehow be stopped. So, in the first strategy of decreasing the production of chylomacrons, we will use dietary modifications and we will also see the use of medical therapy. To enhance the flow through the natural pathways, we will see how medical therapy can help us, which will include the use of antifilarials, anti-inflammatory and antihistaminics. And then we will see the value of postural methods and also the use of abdominal binders. All these are conservative methods to enhance flow through the natural pathway in the lymphatics. And finally, to stop leakage of chyle in the urinary system, we can use endoscopic methods, which means using renal pelvic installation sclerotherapy or even ureteroscopic cauterization of the leakage points. One can also use the surgical methods to interrupt these fistulae, which is either by open surgery, which is called pyelolymphatic disconnection or same thing can be done with the help of laparoscopic methods or even robotic methods. So friends, you have these therapeutic strategies which we employ in our patients. These first two are called conservative methods and these two are the focus of the video at this point of time. So, Decreasing the production of chylomicrons. As I said, one can use dietary modifications and one can also use the medical therapy to achieve this objective. If you were to understand some basic about what are the basis of dietary changes, here is the intestinal mucosa and if on one side the chylomicron has to be produced, the cholesterol for this is the 60% of the cholesterol in the chylomicron comes from the dietary cholesterol. It is absorbed by the intestinal mucosa and brought in here and the 40% of cholesterol is synthesized within the intestinal mucosal cell. So that is how you get the total quota of cholesterol here. If you want to cut down the dietary intake of the cholesterol or fat, lipids, whatever, you can reduce it to only 10 to 20 percent. You cannot make it absolute zero because that is a practical uh, point. Patients somehow at some point of time will take something or the other. So you will cut down to 10%, some, some patient less than 10%. And when this happens, when this happens, what will happen is to meet the body needs, the intestinal mucosa starts making more cholesterol. So you will often notice that only with the dietary restriction of the lipids, the chylurea is not controlled. If this is 60%, this is 40%, in normal situation, which I said, what 
one can also do here that in the the epithelium of the intestinal mucosal cell there is an intestinal cholesterol transport protein which is called neiman pick c1 like one we have evolved a blocker of this protein and this blocker is azetamide and this drug will block the absorption of dietary cholesterol from the intestinal mucosa and instead of 60% it can be cut down to any degree so this is a very potent drug to suppress the absorption from the gi tract but then it does not affect the mucosal cholesterol synthesis to decrease the production of the chyle i said we do dietary modifications and i just told you the basis for dietary modifications what dietary modifications we actually do there are two objectives one is of course to minimize chyle production but when we ask the patient to cut down fat and lipids in their diet there is likelihood of fat malnutrition after all fat is a necessary part of the the body needs so you have to do something to prevent malnutrition of the patient to minimize chyle production you have to reduce the amount of fat in the diet the key thing in the diet is the indian diet the ghee and oil all oils should be restricted all kind of ghee purified non purified all defined everything should be a cut down the food which is high in fat butter cheese meat and fish nuts and seeds chocolates even avocado all this should be stopped and in the same manner all milk products should be stopped and you have to emphasize this on the patient that you have to stop all this then only you can expect some response but when patients follow this very strictly how will the body meet the need of the fat so what we do is we ask these patients to substitute in their diet in place of natural lip fats start taking medium chain triglycerides and to maintain and the body weight of the patient patient should be asked to increase the intake of carbohydrate and increase the intake of protein so that body mass is maintained i hope you know that the fat is absorbed through intestinal lactils and you should also know that all long chain triglycerides are absorbed into the lactils directly as as you can see here and all medium chain triglycerides are absorbed into the venous system the porto venous system so if you substitute in the diet the instead of long chain change to medium chain triglycerides so it will not take the lymphatic route so obviously it will not go to the chyle pathway and it will not leak into the urinary system so ask the patient to take more medium chain triglycerides and the actual source in indian diet is coconut oil so patient should be asked to take edible forms of coconut oil the second approach is to enhance the flow through the lymphatic pathway through the natural pathway you can ask the patient to lie down like this head and down foot and up by about i think about 4 or 5 inches so that patient is not comfortable if patient lies like this then the natural flow of lymphatics in retro peritoneum becomes more cephalad so it will go into natural pathway not into the urinary system it may work in some patients in past people were using abdominal binder for this purpose to generate a positive pressure so that the fistula are occluded and natural lymphatics take the chylus flow the third concept is which has been debatable concept is using drugs to treat filariasis the people have often asked me that chyluria is a manifestation of chronic disease is there still active filariasis here or not that's a big question and second question is 
if there is which drug should be used what dose should be used how long should it be used all these are unanswered questions even today but to tell you that we still use drug therapy for filariasis we use dithiocarbamazine in the dosage 6 mg per kg per day in three divided dosage the standard duration is 2 weeks and we need to repeat this more often because macrophylaria has, has its own life cycle in some cases with refractory one can use albendazole or even ivermectin now this question what is the place of using antifilarials in the management of active kaluria if you see a normal lymphatic here when filariasis inflicts these lymphatics what first happens is that there is an inflammation of the inner intima of the lymphatic the endothelium of the lymphatic and this is called endolymphangitis this will block the flow of lymph from this to the narrow passage and becomes retarded over and above endolymphangitis there is an episode of perilymphangitis there occurs inflammation around the lymphatics which further occludes these lymphatics and the result is that the chyle cannot flow through this occluded passage the lymphatics below get dilated simple thing to understand so what i am saying is that because of a acute lymphangitis and endolymphangitis there occurs obstruction and if a patient is already having some degree of obstruction in the lymphatic pathways in chylus pathways and there occurs another acute attack of filariasis more endolymphangitis more perilymphangitis the obstruction becomes more severe and that is why sudden increase in lymphatic hypertension occurs and that is why there occurs episode of kyluria now we have had some patients wherein at the time of kyluria we had demonstrated live macrophylaria in the hydrocele fluid of these patients as you can see in this video we have even shown in the chylus urine live macrophylaria so tell me how this live macrophylaria is in the urine and why is this live macrophylaria in the hydrocele fluid obviously there is a active filarial disease in this patient and if you measure the acute phase reactants in this patient measure means the patient may have fever patient may have bitter abdominal pain right and uh, uh, you can do blood tests you will find eosinophilia in these patients you will find increased crp you will find macrophylaria in urine and you will also find an elevated antifilarial antibody titer so if you have all these things in that patient you should believe that this is a case of acute over chronic attack and the point i am making here is that if you believe that kyluria is a consequence of chronic progressive retroperitoneal obstructive lymph angiopathy then what happens is there's one episode of lymphangitis which settles after some time another episode of lymphangitis which settles and then another episode of lymphangitis which settles so with every next attack that is coming up this chronic obstructive lymphangiopathy becomes more and more severe and patients have more and more serious form of kyluria so another thing that you should know that when you have to treat the filaria with the anti filarial drug and here if you see the picture of filarial worm inside the filarial worm there is a endoparasite which is called wolbachia and it is today believed that whatever lymphangitis whatever allergic responses you see to a a filarial worm in the peritoneum it is less against the antigens of filarial worm but more against the antigens of wolbachia so we treat today both here is wolbachia the parasite within the parasite this is wolbachia parasite within the parasite so what we do we give these patients dithiocarbamazine as well as doxycycline 
to treat acute attack of filariasis. The key point here is, and which I have attempted to answer through my own experience, and my in my own institution, we have done these trials over a period of time, that what should be the dose of this combination, what should be the duration of this combination, and what will be the risk and benefit as a result of adverse effects. And I throw this question to all of you who are listening to this video to get involved into this study because India is a country where this is a common problem. And you also can look into this aspect of managing chylurics by these anti medications. Also, you should know, and I'm sure you must have experienced, that not all patients respond to the medical therapy. Whatever medical therapy, whatever conservative treatment you do, patients continue to have chyluria, maybe a little less, but they keep bothering you. And we try to evaluate these factors which determine response to medical therapy. We conducted a study in our own institution and we published this paper some time back in 2014. And we found that conservative methods have success about 70%. Right? And it is not determined by the chronicity of the disease, the number of previous episodes. But if patient has a high grade disease and patient has a very high cholesterol in the urine, now this is something which can be objectively measured. You can have a cutoff below this cholesterol, you can expect good response. More than this cholesterol, you can expect poor response. So below a a particular cholesterol level, they respond. More than that, they do not respond. And hematuria is not an independent poor risk factor for conservative management. We found that factors which are not relevant, like duration of disease, disease chronicity, whether it is primary or recurrent, or presence of mild hematuria. But factors which are relevant are, as I said, higher clinical grade will not respond to medical therapy. Heavy pre-treatment with drugs in past and patient coming now with again chyluria, he may not respond. Patient who have higher urinary cholesterol loss at the, at the base level will not respond. And those who have a major degree of hematuria or chyluric hematuria also will not respond to medical therapy. This is a poor responder group. So I hope you understood the place of conservative methods in the management of chyluria. And in my next video, I shall talk to you about the use of interventional methods for managing chylurics. Thank you very much for your patient listening. In case you have any questions or comments, you can put on my email.